video anyway. All right, so we're talking about that scheduling, and I hope everybody's looked at the chapter, and they've said, all right, we're, we, we figured out some of this, and some of this makes sense. One of the things we have to do is estimate and try to identify what resources we need for a particular task. We've broken it down, but now we need to figure out what kind of resources. And that resources isn't always money. Sometimes it's materials. Maybe we only have one backhoe. Maybe we need multiple backhoes. How do I find the right resources, equipment? Maybe it's finding resources in a building, so finding classrooms, finding spots. So people, materials, money, all of those things are, are in there. These can all affect that duration of that project. If I don't have enough equipment to do the project in multiples, so in other words, I have to wait for the backhoe to get done, to move to another area to dig, that can affect that time on this. Those estimates also are going to influence our costs. So how we figure out if we have enough resources might influence costs. And so right now, one of the things we find is there's not enough people to do some of the jobs we want to do. With COVID, some people are unable to work or unable to do jobs. That affects our resource leveling. How do we, how do we come up with resources for all of this? So activity durations. So for an activity, for each individual activity, we really are going to think about it this way. So we made our box, and our box is still not changed. And So the other piece, I was going to draw on this screen really nicely with my iPad that I can show you on the screen. And Apple has generously not decided that it can no longer trust my computer and will not charge. Great. Thank you, Apple. So over here on the left is our activity number. That's not going to change. That's always going to be there, and it's unique for that activity. On the right is our estimated duration. So now we're starting to fill in that box and get more information as we start putting details in there. So varnish floors. So now, when I look at that, is that five weeks, five days, five hours, five minutes? Doesn't really say, does it? So we need to make sure that we're on the same units. So maybe it's a really big project in a building. That's five weeks to varnish all the floors. Is that different than five days? Certainly. So. In this case, I believe it's set up for days, so five days to varnish, one day to move back furniture. So activity on the bottom, on, on the left, time on the right. And what that allows us to start building then is now we have a little more information. And so we can fill this out a little better because we know an activity and we know a time. We also know those predecessors. And those predecessors have allowed us to build a network diagram. And so a network diagram that looks like this, we can now start figuring out how long that entire task is going to take. So from one end to the other, we can now start to identify how long it's going to take. I could add up the sum of all of the times, bless you, bless you, I could add up a sum of all the times, and that tells me how much time it's going to take to do the project in total. How many man hours, or how many people hours, or whatever quantity of, of description you want that way. But it doesn't tell me how long it's really going to take to do that project from start to end. So, we're going to jump ahead a little bit, and we're going to show you something called the critical path. So from task one to task two, it's pretty clear. There's not really an alternative, is there? So task one to task two to task three to task four. But here's where I change. Now here, I have a couple of different routes I can leave task four. I can go with a task of two. I can go with a task of 10, 12, or two. Critical path is weird. I want the shortest time for the entire project, right? But I'm going, when I have a multiple decision like this, I'm going to take the longest time for the entire project. If I picked one of these times, I would have time in there I couldn't account for doing. So I always take the longest. So critical path 
I know it's a weird way to say it. It's the longest, shortest path. So it's the longest path through here, but it's the shortest time we can do the entire job. So here we're going to pick 12 days. And then we have this one here, where I have a choice between 65 and 5. Which one are we going to pick? I, I hope that you're going to pick 65. And then 7 weeks, 8 weeks, or eight, 7 days, 8 days, and 10 days. So if I added up all those items on the critical path, that gives me an estimate of the entire project, how long it's going to take. And notice we, we have some areas in there, and we'll talk about them called slack. Because this period here is really 12 days, or 12 units, whatever we're talking about. Some of those don't take 12 units to make, do they? So there's what we call slack time. In other words, I developed that test data or whatever, software test data. There's 10 weeks of slack time in there, isn't there? Yeah. So what we have to do then is we start managing those resources to make this appropriate. So we're getting just a little ahead of where the book wants to go. But so. We've now said, all right, we now have a project. We know kind of an estimate of how long it's going to take. And we can pick a start and a finish date then. So we know at some point in the future we're going to start it. It's going to take however number of weeks. I did not add those up. Let's say it's going to take 75 weeks or 75 days. We pick a start date. We pick an end date. Is that always accurate? Huh. So we may also have to look at other things with it. So I can't start until the customer or internal or external says, hey, I can do this. That movement of date in the future may change. Because if I move it in the future, I may not know those same resources. I may not have those available. So sometimes we have delays in that, and we have to think about what's going to happen. If I don't start this project today, but I start it a year from now, is that still a valid estimate for those times and those resources? So it's not always as cut and dried. So there's some other things that we need to do. And one of them we need to do is we have to figure out what that task time is really going to be. To estimate the duration of each activity. Well, this is where I'm going to give you your first math formula in here. Everybody likes math formulas, right? No? There didn't. Oh, it's a class I teach. There's always going to be math, unfortunately. So this one's actually pretty easy to do. So. There are a lot of different ways to do this, but the generic formula on this, I'm just going to use Notepad and bring it up here and see if we can look at it, is we're going to need three time estimates. So every activity, so let's say we're going to write a paper. And I need an optimistic, I need a pessimistic, And I need a, let's call it a general time, or maybe this is your most likely. So I need three estimates for writing a paper. So if I have to write a five-page paper, what's my most optimistic time it'll take? What's an optimistic time? Five hours. OK, so five hours. An hour a, pa a page. Now, now you looked at those requirements, oh, and there's a lot of research have to happen. What's a pessimistic time for a five-page paper? I'll go with 15. We can do that. 15 hours. But because you've written a whole lot of them, you're going to also have a number, the most likely. What's the most likely time it's going to take to write that paper? How many? Oh, hang on. Let me put one. 
So if our most optimistic number is 5 hours, it should be between those two, your most likely number. Because your, pes your pessimistic would be the, the worst outcome. The most optimistic would be the best outcome. So for purposes of making life easy, 10 hours. So now we have this, we have three numbers. What do we do with them? So we are going to do, this is called a beta distribution. That's a big fancy word for saying we're going to do kind of a weighted average. So the formula is 1 times optimistic plus, let's go all the way over here and say 1 times our pessimistic. And then if we take 4 times our most likely, and we take all of this, this is where the drawing would be a lot easier. So I take all of that, and I divide it by 6. So really what I've done, I'm adding those together, sorry. I need to put another plus symbol in there. So. What I've done is created a weighted average. So I have 1 times the optimistic, plus 4 times the most likely, plus 1 times the pessimistic, all divided by 6. So it's just a weighted average. So if I put those numbers in, and I do this, I'm going to end up with, so 5 plus, what's 4 times 10 is 40 plus 15, what does that equal off the top of somebody's head? 60? 60, and I'm going to divide that by 6. So this one comes out weird that our beta distribution is 10 hours. Now, other numbers we put in, it's probably going to be a decimal fraction of some sort. This one just happened to work out really weird that way. But what this does is it takes into account my worst number, so maybe I think that job's going to take this long, my best number, and our most likely outcome. And the more experience we have writing papers, the better we are at picking that most likely outcome, and so this approves over time. But it also includes, so it includes the bad, it includes the good, and our most likely estimate. Typically, this will skew numbers up because we know that our, our pessimistic is going to make it a little higher. In this case, our pessimistic wasn't enough to really skew that up. Either that or my math is possibly bad, I don't know. But in this case, we come up with an answer. So we say this is our using beta distribution, it's not that tough. It sounds horrible, but it's really one of the bad, one of the good, and four of the most likely, and then we just divide them by six. So it's what we call a weighted average. There are some variations on this that you may use and some project managers may use. If I know that there may be more weight towards a pessimistic answer, I can reduce that from four so I could say three of the most likely, and then I divide it by five. Or in some cases, they call it a triangle, and they just add pessimistic, optimistic, and most likely, and divide by three. And so we get a, a different view. So it's how much do you want to weight that most likely number. But I'm going to say if you're going to do one of these methods, do it consistently throughout all those work breakdown structures. Now, are there other ways we could do that? If I have history of these projects, if I have history of those projects, could I pick a number that is going to be two standard deviations and I can do those statistical analysis? Shall we do that? Oh. You guys don't sound as excited as that as I do. So most of the time, we just do something like this. Can we do it with statistics? Yes. If we have a set of data, I can certainly look at what number encompasses the top two, you know, two percent, or if we want to exclude five percent, or ten, or ninety, whatever it is we want to do, we can certainly do that. Or two standard deviations out, three standard deviations. But this actually works pretty well. 
And again, this one came out kind of interesting, and I'm not really, really sure how we managed to do the math exactly like that. But had we put in other numbers or had we put in other values, would come up a little different. But one times optimistic, four times most likely, and one times pessimistic, all divided by six. That's not as bad a formula as you could ever have, right? That one's pretty easy. Perfect. And in fact, what you'd probably do if you're doing a lot of these is you'd build an Excel template and you would just put in some of these values and be able to do it pretty easily. So we have a lot of little acronyms and little shortcuts. So you're going to see us do ES, EF. So earliest start, earliest finish. So this is one way. We start at a given point and move towards the future. So early finish is our early start time plus how long it's going to take. Well, that's pretty simple, right? But when we start drawing it out, sometimes people get all panicked and go, oh my goodness, what is all this information we're giving? So here we have what is the early start for dress rehearsal? Oh, all right. So early start for dress rehearsal time zero right but what is our early finish oh. okay so we first we have to find out what the duration of this activity is so i have five ten or four which one of these am i going to pick for my duration for this period of time the ten and i'm going to pick a dress rehearsal of two here there's only one choice so this entire activity is going to take 12 days, 12 weeks, 12 units, whatever it is. So early start is 0, early finish is 10 plus 2 or 12. So the earliest we can finish is 12 units from 0 if we started it at that point. So here we have one activity, and we can do the same thing. Early start is 0. Duration is 3. Early finish, then, is 0 plus 3 or 3. Well, this sounds way too easy when we do it this way. Early start, early finish. So here we have another one. Early start, early finish. So here we can say, well, we know it's going to take 13 units of some kind of time. So early start is 0, early finish is 13. Now, this one is a little, little different. So where did we get, so early start is early finish of task two. So what we're saying is there's a task here that we're not showing. It ends, it ends at time 13, 13 days, 13 weeks, 13 hours. Where that ends, so our early start now is 13. Our duration in this activity is 20. So early finish then is at unit 33. And so on the top, they've got a timeline here. So here's an activity that goes from 0 to 3, 3 to 13, 13 to 33. So the early start is not always 0 unless we're all the way at the very beginning activity. So here, we're moving through here again, and notice we're putting these up at the top of every one. Early start, early finish. Early start, early finish. Hmm. So here we've got early start of 13, the task is 20, early finish is 33. Here it starts at 33, task is 5, early finish then is 38. So we're starting to build some details in here. Oh! Oh, holy cow. Now, now we've built this, and we have a lot of details. And notice each activity, 
So activity four, five units long, 33 to 38. But now we run into this where we have all of these are dependent on task four. These are not the same units of time. And so each one of these is going to have the same early start. That's driven by the task ahead of it. But look at the early finish. So here we're at week 40, week 50, week 48, week 40. Those are not all the same early finishes. Mm. All right. Hang with me. We're going to go a little further into this one. So now, now we have a conundrum. And here's where we can start to see what we call that slack. So all of these tasks started at week 38, if we'll call it weeks. And they had the task time, so here's our early finish here. But my time here on the right, and so we'll look at these two on the bottom separately here. So this one ends at week 50. This unit ends at week 40. But the earliest, because both of these have to be done, the earliest I can start is week 50. Up here, those tasks are both dependent on 5 and 6, or task 9 is dependent on 5 and 6. And I have an early finish of 40 and an early finish of 48. But I can't start task 9 until both of those are done. Therefore, that early start is 48. But what I already see now, if I look at those, I see that slack. So from task 5 to task 9, how many, how many units of slack are there? So from task 9 to task 5, so 48 minus 40 is how many units of slack? Eight weeks, eight units, all right. And the same thing down here, I have slack from here to here. I have 10 units of slack. So if you're working at a job and they're paying you to do things and suddenly you have 10 weeks where you don't have anything to do, are you happy? I hope not. I hope not, but so. Early finish, so now we get all the way here to this step. And look at these early finishes. So the earliest finish here on this task, task 10, is 55 weeks. The earliest finish on task 9 is 113 weeks or 113 days. Ooh, it's way out there. And so we get to the next step. And now we really see some slack. Because both of these tasks have to be completed before I can input response data. But this one gets done at week 55. That one gets done at week 113. And so there is a pretty good size gap from 113 to 55. And again, we call that, that slack. And then we, we finish this out working our early starts, early finishes. So we have 113 to 120. And when you don't have multiple activities or multiple dependencies, that's pretty easy. 113 to 120, 120 to 128. Then we have a prepare the report. 120 to 128, 128 to 138. And if we had said, hey, this project, we need it done in 120 weeks, it may not be done in that amount of time. So this gives us then 138 says this is our critical path through there. It's going to take 138 units of whatever time that is. Ah. Anybody guess what program would be great for making these? Sp yeah, spreadsheet or as we're going to talk about something like Microsoft Office or a Microsoft Project. So here we've added a little more detail and it makes it a little easier because now we have duration. So instead of a visual path, now we're looking at it and we still have those same dependencies. 
So we have estimated duration, we have start, and we have finish. And as we start looking through there, now we can start to find some of those slack activities. And the way we're going to do this is now we need to come back and do it kind of the backwards way. We have late start and late finish. So late start is the late finish minus that duration. All right. So here, we're going to go backwards. So we know that we want it done at day 30, and we're going to work our way backwards. So then now we're going to draw some additional piece. Latest finish, latest start. And so it's really just the reverse of what we did with the early finish, early start. So here if we look at these activities, we have the early finish, early, or early start, early finish on the top. Now on the bottom, here is our required completion date at 130. We minus 10, so 120. Because that goes straight through, there's not multiples, it's 120 here for an early, and then minus eight. So our late finish minus our duration then gives us our late start. So these all come into play as we start working through here. So we can go backwards through this entire thing. So here it gets a little more interesting. So here we have 30 as our late finish. And here we have 25 for a late start and 20 for a late start. But notice what we do for a late start on the other one. Hmm. Did we take the smallest value? And as we work our way through, so late start. The last time that I can start an activity, the latest finish, the, last, the latest time which an activity must be completed. So late start is late finish minus duration. That one we've seen before. But now, now we have early starts in our table. We can actually add then those late starts. And we can go through the same thing. So let me see if I have my sheet there. Chunk, chunk, oop, wrong way. It would help if I did it this way. We're going to go backwards. We do the same thing. I'm not going to bore you with that. But now, look at this. So we have started. So we have a start and finish for each activity. And we have a latest start and finish. In this case, notice we have some negative numbers. So what that's saying is, whatever our start date was anticipated, and our finish date, if we said it had to be done in 130 days or 130 weeks, we'd have had to start it eight days before day zero. Mm. Well, that's not good. So this can allow us to calculate whether we're going to get something done. And then we're going to look at something called slack or float. The difference between the early finish time of an activity and the project required completion time. There. So positive slack, so if I have a positive number, says that those activities can be delayed. So in other words, as activities, there's one really big one. Let me see if I can get back to it really quickly. Chunk, 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 chunk. If I can find it. Easy way to show you. I want the whole thing. Come back. So there are some really big ones. So positive slack here, we have 60 units of positive slack between activities 9, 10, and activities 11. So that means I can delay that test software. I don't have to do it at week whatever we are, at 10 or 15. I can put it anywhere along that 60 weeks of slack. It doesn't make any difference where I do that at. Negative slack, though, a lot 
the slides in there. So negative slack says, oh, we can't, and in fact, we have to add time or we have to crunch something. Somehow we don't have enough time to get something done. That makes sense. If I have a negative number, that means it's generally bad. So I can do a couple of things. I can parallel more activities if I can. I can speed up a process somehow. I can add more time to the project. So there are things that we can sometimes do that with. So think about our mailing out of postage cards, though. Is there any way we can change how long it's going to take to mail something and to get a return back? Is that something we have any influence over? No. But think about if I needed to write a thousand postage cards all by hand. And if I said one person, it's going to take three weeks. Is there something we could do to make that process faster? Yeah, I could put four or five or ten people on that task, and I could make that faster. So some things we can control, some things we can't. So external events tend to be ones we can't control. There's also times where we can't do things any faster because of those precedents. In other words, I can't put in my data into this system until I get all those postcards back. But sometimes technology lends us a hand. So maybe instead of sending by mail postcards to get a survey, what could I do? Is there a technology solution to get information from people? Email, or I could do a web survey. Now, I know that sometimes those results are not exactly the same, but hopefully we get something very similar. So Slack is that difference. So critical path, critical path. So generically, we say it's the longest path through the entire network. Mathematically, we can also look at it as those sets of activities have, that have the least slack. Generally, zero slack on a critical path. So mathematically, we can also do it. And mathematically, it might look like this, because we look at total slack on each one of these. And so those activities that have the least slack, those are those activities that are on this critical path. And so here they've shown it in blue and said, all right, here's our activities. This is our maximum size of our, of our project. And in this case, I think they say it's 130 days, possibly. I think that's what that says. I can't really read on the projector. But critical path, the longest path through, or the path with the least amount of slack. So in this case, all of those slack items that are negative are on the critical path. Well, that's how tools like Microsoft Project or Project Libre are going to calculate what's on the critical path, is they're looking at slack. And they say, oh, I see a, a value that's negative, probably on the critical path. I look at those least value activities. We have not yet developed a computer system that really looks at something with visual acuity, like what we do to determine that critical path in most cases. So, If we change something in our project, then we can change that critical path, and we can actually do that. So we're going to look at Slack in a lot of different ways. So I'm going to jump through a lot of this really quickly, because I know I want to get into the next piece that we're going to start. The other thing we can do that's really handy on our project is this thing called a Gantt chart. So you may have seen them in other classes. You may have seen it other places. It really represents time and activities. And we can do it in Excel. You can actually build these in Excel. But over time, it's showing all of your tasks, their dependencies, in other words, what we have to have to start an activity. And so it's a great big graphic on how to complete your project. 
So it shows over time, it shows the activities. Once we start putting in data of completions, it can even show whether you're on time, on task, on budget. So these Gantt charts are a really powerful tool in project management. So we know, no matter how well we plan this, no matter what we do, there's going to be something that's going to be different. And most of the time it has to do with people. People are not always the same. Things happen in a project. So one of the things we have to do, and that's really great about once we have all these data points in there, is now we have to figure out how to fix what's gone wrong. So if you look at this as a flow chart, so we establish our budget and scope and all of our pieces up top. We're performing the project, and we have a reporting period. And so sometimes that's a week, sometimes it's a month, depending on the project, what's going on. Some very fast-paced things like some scrum projects, you may have a reporting every week or every day at the beginning of the day about what happened the day before. So during that report, we're going to collect data. We're going to see what actually happened. And then we're going to calculate what we can do to get it back on track. So we're never going to be 100% on track. Some points we may be ahead, some points we may be behind. When we're ahead, sometimes that leads to other questions of, can we finish this project early? How does that affect, if we're a week ahead here, how does that affect us later on? So think about a road construction where they've, they've got to move all the dirt and get it into place. And then they've got to level the dirt. They've got to compact the dirt. Then they've got to get the forms ready to pour concrete. If I get some of that done early, that sounds really great, except what do I do with that time between they've got the ground ready to go and the forms are there and the concrete trucks actually show up? Because I can't necessarily always move those. So those corrections are not necessarily always because you're behind. Sometimes being ahead can actually be a bit of a problem also. So you have to make sure that. So here we say, are there corrective actions? Identify what they are, and you're really forming a loop then of each reporting period saying, what are we doing? How are we going? What is the progress? What do I need to change at this point to make this project successful? So here we're just showing we've completed a task, but Notice what happened. Notice what happens in here. So we projected that we'd have a finish at, because this is 0.0, it's seven units, that it was at seven days or seven weeks, but our actual finish is at 10. Oh. So now my early start for patching moves from seven, it moves to 10. Well, 10 plus 5, oh. So we take some of that slack that's hopefully in there, and we start pulling that out. So in this case, we remove some of the slack. Changes are always going to happen. How do they keep from biting you in the rear end? So if the customer or the project group, or whoever says, hey, we need to make a change. That's something that you really need to have documented. It needs to be part of that change control. Because if they decide, hey, we're going to do something different, we're going to tile all these classrooms instead of just paint them, but they're still expecting that completion date at the same time, that's probably not going to have, have a really good outcome. So. Once I see a change, I can estimate what its impact is. I can go back and I can obtain approval, make sure that my T's are crossed and my I's are dotted, and see what's going to happen. And we know that the earlier changes are have less effect than something later on, for the most part. If an early change is going to completely revise the project, then it's probably time we, we look at that change management. So if we're going to go from, hey, we're going to remodel this building to, hey, we're going to demolish it and build a new facility, 
whoa, wait a minute, hold on, that's a little bit far out there, and we need to probably look at that, How, what's, what are those changes like? Late changes, and, it, and again, it depends on what it's going to do. If, if we're going to change the color from gray to white, well, maybe that's a trip to the paint store and a couple extra gallons of paint. That's not a big change. So where does it happen? So project scheduling. One of the things that's really great about these, it will allow you to look and see if things change on that critical path. Because if we use up all that slack and an activity goes outside of its slack time, it's going to suddenly start changing that critical path and your entire project is going to possibly go down the, down the drain a little bit. So, what are some common things we're going to see? Well. Maybe we didn't, we didn't look at that scope. That scope continues to grow. That's one of them that happens a lot. Maybe we didn't do something right. We underestimated how hard it was going to be to dig out concrete or how hard it was going to be to do some new coating. So there's a lot of different reasons why projects grow out of there. So here's an information system one that we can use kind of as, a, as an example. So here it says, gather data, study feasibility, prepare problem definitions, and we could actually build that network diagram and you could see what it's going to look like. So normally I torture students and I make you guys all do this one by hand really quickly. I'm not at this case because I want get, to get started on this other activity, but this is what that, that network diagram. So once we put the dependencies in there, and we started doing the early start and early finish times. Now we have our first run through there. Now we do it again and we put our late start, late finish times on there. So same project, but we go from beginning to end each direction. And now we have our, our table that we've created. So we can consider then, so a duration, we have early starts, late starts, latest starts, late finishes, and we can look at that total slack, and we can actually see what is going to be on that critical path. So when we have two activities, we're always taking that one, that longest path through here. So this one's a little more complicated. This is in that slide deck, and I encourage you to make sure you can go through and do this. So this says these activities are all on that, on that critical path. Our critical path is 50 days. So we have a little bit of slack on some of those activities, but there's not a lot in this particular case. Here we've actually performed some activities, and as we're doing it, now we can actually see what the, what the ramifications are of what's going on. So there's an updated total. And so notice we kind of eliminate those as we go through here. So actual finish, and then this moves through. So if this was a spreadsheet, if you were just using, you could actually have that auto populate and go down and affect those as they go. So instead of using just numbers, you would use formulas. So project management software. So Calculates our early starts, late starts, total slack, critical path. Once we start putting data in, it's that control piece. So what I would like to do is start on in here. And we won't, you guys won't get it finished, but hopefully you guys can get a start on what your assignment is using our friend Project Libre. So I need a couple of things from you. I need Project Libre, so you can follow, fire that up. So if you don't have it, search Project Libre and download and install it. it it's very small, very simple, and seems to run on about everything. The second thing you're going to need is you're going to need to go into Blackboard and launch your book. Because we're going to take the assignment out of the end of Chapter 4. There is an appendix assignment. And I try. I was going to just copy it in, but I could not do it with all the pictures, so I gave up and I just said, here, we'll go there and we'll look at it together here in class. So at the end of Chapter 4, get out of here really quickly so at the end of chapter four 
So I'm just going to grab the book and launch somewhere, loading content. I'm going to grab the entire book. I'm going to make it larger. And I'm going to go to Table of Contents, and I'm going to go to Chapter 4. At the back of Chapter 4 is this Appendix 410E, Microsoft Project. So this project is we are going to do, but we don't have Microsoft Project. We're going to try this with Project Libre. So it takes you through the task. What is going to be different is some of these are going to look a little different as we input data. So will it still show us the same information? Yes. So here is your task. So you're going to have to do this, but you have a couple of things to help you out along the way. Let me launch this and drag it over. So your assignment, I actually give you the final project or, or a final one that should be very similar to what you end up with as a check value. So I can actually save this one and I can open it and I can see what I should end up with in Project Libre. Now, it's not quite the same, so don't just go, oh, I, I already have it, I copied it, I can do that. It is not quite the same, but it's very similar. So here's my Gantt chart. I can see it as a network diagram. So notice here, it even shows me those items in red are on the critical path. So it does most of the same things that Microsoft Project will do. Let me make it a little smaller so I can see it on the screen. So it'll do a work breakdown structure. So here's our work breakdown structure. And we don't have a lot of details in there yet. But this will give you a, a place to start to look at. So the great thing is I can actually do two of these at the same time. And I can call this Chapter 4 Assignment. And we're going to actually move on with this. So notice now I can, I can look at that. I can start this project based on that text from here. But I give you a check value. So what I'm actually looking for then is as you're doing this, as you're building this, is you're going to create this file in Project Libre. And you're going to keep in a Word document a running log of how it compared to the instructions. In other words, if something was completely different, we can look at it and talk about it and say, I was unable to create a baseline because Project Libra didn't have baselines, or I couldn't figure it out. So we need a little bit of help. And so the place I'm going to send you, if I can type today, so if I go to Project Libre's home, apparently I've opened it about a dozen times now, there are a couple of things that can help you over here. So there are discussions, blog posts, user groups. What there is not, and one of the issues with this, is there is not, compared to Microsoft Project, there is not all the resources. In Microsoft Project, there's help features, and there's billions of videos and things. Project Libre is a little more on your own. For that, you're saving $1,000 in software, and I don't have to make you take out the rest of Microsoft Office 365. So that is your assignment this week. And so that is due Sunday night. It should not take that long to do. When I ran through it, it took me about 40 minutes to do really quickly to come up with. You have this as a... This will not necessarily be exactly the same, but you can look at it as a check value. Does this look very similar? 
then that gives us an idea we can start to discuss this. Next week we're going to do and then next another piece in my project Libre, but I'm going to give you a start file that you can start with so we're all at the same place. So you can then move on and we can look at what kind of controls and what kind of the things it's got in there. All right. I wanted to let you guys get started in class so if you had any immediate questions you could we could hang out. I will be around if you run into something really bad, send me an email. I will try to respond as quickly as possible. I will be up in Omaha probably at a racetrack, so I will respond as quickly as possible this weekend. All right, any questions? All right, I'm going to hit close on the video and upload that.